Welcome back, everyone. Uh, our, next, our next lecture is titled uh, Ethics-Based Open Washing in the AI Licensing Domain. Please welcome Niharika Singha. Thank you, everyone. Um, good evening to you all. My name is Niharika, and I'm an IT lawyer based in Estonia. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, my work that I delivered um, alongside Free Software Foundation Europe for the European Commission. And um, it's about this pernicious issue of um, ethics-based open washing in the AI licensing domain. Um, and this topic basically affects the entire FOSS ecosystem, and which is why I'm super grateful to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this um, important topic. So, um, I will start the presentation with asking you as to why do you think this is an important topic. Um, so first of all, um, we've experienced this you know, influx of AI systems um, over the past few years, and uh, you know, it's just um, over the course of a few months, it's just exploding. Um, and so with this, what we've been noticing is this um, practice of calling everything or labeling everything as open and free. And why do companies do that? First of all, because um, the term open and free have a very positive connotation attached to it. For a user, if anything is labeled as open and free, um, they automatically repose a lot of faith because you know, if you can inspect and verify and scrutinize the source code, you automatically repose faith into the solution, into the technology. So what companies are doing, um, so they're basically uh, announcing the launch of their product, the solution, um, marketing it as open and free, um, collecting all the brownie points um, by calling it as open and free, and not even disclosing um, the important information about the data or the source code, and um, thereby just escaping the legal and scientific scrutiny. And this is extremely disturbing um, because what we're trying to do now with this project is we're trying to spread the information, we're trying to spread the awareness about um, the consequences of this practice. And for that, I would first like to begin with um, what the concept of openness in AI actually means and uh, what are the important terminologies associated with it. So, first of all, I know that this uh, brilliant um, audience already knows about what free software and open source software is, but for anybody who's joining us um, for the first time in this conference, or anybody who's getting introduced to the world of free and open source software, I'm just going to give a brief overview. So free software basically provides you with four freedoms, freedoms to use, study, share, and improve. And open source um, is basically an, um, the term curated by open source uh, initiative. And it means that it's not only access to the source code, but it also means that you have to comply with all these conditions. So now what are the reasons for engaging with uh, free software? The multiple reasons. First off, um, pr proprietary licenses fundamentally are incompatible to each other. And on the other hand, free software licenses are well standardized, they're well documented, and have withstood complex legal issues. Um, so as you see, they provide autonomy, collaboration, share and copy is easy, you can reuse the code. And by doing this, they're basically um, simplifying license adoption, they're increasing the legal interoperability, and um, yeah, avoiding the problem of license proliferation. So, in a way, the free and open source movement um, has basically, you know, has had an, a significant impact on the software development over the course of years. Um, earlier, proprietary systems used to lock in users, limit the access, and hence they used to stagnate innovation. But by using free and open source licenses, um, we've basically, you know, opened the code, we've allowed more innovation, we fostered global collaboration. So if I were to juxtapose all of these to say ethical principles, then rightly so, free and open source software is an ethical movement in itself because um, it has aided to say altruism, to social justice, to promotion of digital commons, etc. And that's great news because Free and open source software powers much of the internet's uh, infrastructure, including the key machine learning frameworks and popular projects like Kubernetes, Linux, PyTorch, etc. 
And it's also become an indispensable part of AI research and development. And so it forms the backbone, or is rather now forming the backbone of AI research as well. And uh, again, in terms of ethics, I would say then um, rightly so that it contributes to um, AI accessibility, fairness, transparency. But um, AI systems don't operate like traditional software. They have multiple interconnected components and require distinct uh, development uh, processes uh, that rely mostly on specialized resources in the hands of big tech. So while the ideology of free and open source software um, is mapped into the concept of open AI, we must be careful because uh, there is a significant difference between the two. And that's only because of the way that it's built. And um, yeah, so you know, just because of this, there are a lot of uh, components at play here. So sometimes um, the code around the weight might be open source, but the model isn't. And so while the publicly available models um, are just exploding um, year on year, uh, what is particularly concerning is this popularization of the term open um, in relation to AI systems. Now, many of these um, AI systems don't even use, or th that, um, those that call themselves as open don't even use a free and open source license. And so, um, what is happening is that the term open is being broadly used to define certain AI systems that provide some minimal transparency and accessibility. And um, yeah, this is problematic because if you must apply the spirit of free and open source software into AI systems, then we must also conform to the key pillars that actually make them free and open. For, that, for example, transparency, which means the ability to um, provide the source code to a third party, or reusability, to have uh, appropriate um, free software and uh, open source software licenses in place uh, that can enable anybody to reuse the code. Or oversight, the ability to verify and inspect the source code, or enablement that uh, basically allows you to provide certain information in order to um, run the same um, application. So, um, yeah. And because of these reasons, um, the concept of openness in AI is a very encumbered concept. Primarily also due to the fact that uh, we do not have a robust definition for openness in AI yet. And in this regard, um, Open Source Initiative has taken a wonderful initiative to come up with a definition that takes into account not only the traditional four freedoms as provided by free software, that is freedom to study, use, share, and improve, but it also takes into account um, a wide spectrum of all AI technologies. And until we do not have a definition for open, or what openness in AI actually looks like, um, we have several connotations of force in the AI domain today. So some may proclaim that AI labeled as open exists on a long gradient. So as you see here, um, on one end of the gradient, you'll have some maximally open AI systems. Um, and on the other hand, there are some fully closed AI systems. Uh, for example, at the top of my head, I would say Meta's Llama 2 or even Llama 3. Uh, which provide um, a lot of prohibitions on the terms and conditions of the use of their license. Um, also require a special license from Meta in order to, if, if um, there are a number of uh, users, and uh, provides no meaningful transparency. So there is one approach for defining what openness in AI would look like. Others proclaim that um, openness in AI can be based on this scoring criteria approach which means that in this entire matrix, you have different elements to define how open or how closed an AI system could be. And in this matrix, uh, the important elements here are availability, documentation, and access. And under, this, um, under these elements, you have some sub-elements, and um, I would highly recommend anybody who wants to um, understand this topic or want to, wants to deep dive into this topic to read this paper because um, it gives you a great insight into each sub-element of, uh, uh, of this table that uh, you know, just, just basically tells you about openness of AI on the basis of scoring approach. 
So, um, what we've also witnessed is that uh, in the past few decades, there's been um, a slight shift in the trends. So, diverse groups and individuals have departed from exclusively using uh, free software licenses to using licenses that basically have or levy predetermined restrictions um, on the use of the software and on the distribution of the software, primarily. Uh, based on, say, field of endeavor, behavior, community management, commercial practice, incompatibility. And this has now, this entire practice has now spilled over to this uh, sumo creation of ethic codes for AI systems. Um, so in 2021, we had OES, which also created this um, Hippocratic license, which basically prohibits the use of software in violation of the universal standards for human rights. And as I mentioned about the ethical um, codes for AI systems, we have Meta's Llama 2, and also the newly released uh, Llama 3, which have an entire appendix dedicated to different prohibitory clauses, restrictions, and um, you know, as, as also mentioned here, it also has this additional commercial terms uh, clause, which um, uh, basically requires a special license from Meta in case um, you have number of users. And there's a similar list um, or similar appendix uh, for Big Science Open Rail M license as well with uh, several prohibitory clauses. And coming to now the implications of use of licenses with additional behavior restrictions. Now, first off, what I just showed you were some examples of um, of licenses that are using these prohibitory terms and conditions. And what happens is that since these licensing terms and conditions are pretty vague, ambiguous, um, it makes the downstream integration and uh, application of the software code extremely contentious. Um, it hinders any kind of uh, collaboration between different code bases, and which is why it just creates a barrier against its use and reuse. Hurdles to adoption and improvement. This can come by way of, uh, you know, prohibiting uh, downstream use of, or uh, prohibiting unauthorized use of derivative works, um, or any sort of prohibition on copyleft clauses. Um, this also causes hindrances to control over technology. So, mostly now uh, the users are at the mercy of providers because they just lock in users with several strict API controls, and uh, we have a number of vendor lock-in uh, clauses as well, and uh, weakening of oversight and transparency. So um, proprietary systems or proprietary AI systems could also be transparent, but the free and open source um, AI licenses basically enable transparency by allowing this ability to um, make them auditable, to make them inspectable, um, and yeah, so it just provides um, a layer of uh, transparency. And now with the several regulations that, that are coming up, uh, especially in the EU, um, regarding the AI, um, there's a strong focus and need for various risk evaluation and standard um, assessment um, tests. And for that purpose, free and open source software can actually be a great aid because it can allow um, these third-party code audits, etc., and that just fosters a lot of transparency. Um, and yeah, then coming to the most important aspect of what are the potential benefits of openness in AI. So, what is the purpose of basically having, um, say, a free and open source license? It basically um, creates, you know, this this legal interoperability between different code bases. Uh, it provides protection to the software user, to the software owner from frivolous claims, and it provides this legal certainty to the use of the source code. And if we to talk about these potential benefits of openness in AI, then of course, being open is better than being closed, at least in most cases. And if you know in an AI system as to what is open and how much of it is open, you can actually make better decisions. So yeah, um, I'm just keeping it very short. Um, so in conclusion to our recommendations to the European Commission, we've come up with um, a few recommendations to them. First is to preserve the openness in AI. Um, 
then to keep the licenses interoperable with free software licenses. So in the future, um, new dedicated AI licenses is a big probability. It's a natural progression and it's a well-desired phenomenon. We only plead that these new AI dedicated, new dedicated AI licenses should be interoperable with free software licenses to maintain um, the reusability, sustainability of AI systems. Then accessibility, reusability, and sustainability of AI systems, and coming to the ethical compliance checklist. So ethics um, is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a concept which is based in social values and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, basically social values that, that differ from one jurisdiction to another. So what would be ethical, say, in one jurisdiction may or may not be as ethical in another. Um, and so uh, we must be extremely careful before embedding any kind of ethics or ethical values into technologies. Um, there are multiple ways that um, a lot of AI researchers and developers have um, you know, come around to, to, to basically counter this problem of AI risk and security and to make it ethically compliant. Um, some of it is uh, that they've created certain auditing tools uh, for checking like the robustness, the fairness, and the explainability of AI systems. Others have created this assessment framework for um, foundation models. And some have also created these ethics um, committee or ethics boards in their various AI research labs. So for example, Meta has this oversight board. Um, Google, um, Google DeepMind has this um, responsibility and security council. Microsoft has this Aether committee. And so there are different ways to basically um, include um, ethics into or embed ethics uh, safely without uh, leaving all these additional um, restrictive clauses into your licenses. There are multiple ways to make an AI system ethically compliant, but what we're trying to say is that any of these ways should not be by way of licenses, because placing any kinds of restrictions onto the terms and conditions of licenses should come within the purview of laws and regulations, because these licenses are not a substitute for good governance or a substitute for, say, legislations, and they also cannot be. But at the same time, there's also no need to essentially label everything as open and free. And sometimes the law also prohibits it. So in doing so, and if you must uh, label something as open and free, you must actually conform to the principles curated by Free Software Foundation or the, the, the definitions um, of free software and open source software because they carry with them a rich legacy of over 40 years of democratizing software control. So if you must call uh, your AI project as open and free, they must actually comply with these definitions. And if you don't, then you basically water down the standards that have been created by them. And if you denude the standards, then basically, Anything that becomes or can be labeled as open and free um, can be misused or uh, the use can be just very contentious. And this will just then inundate your legal and compliance team with a lot and lots and lots of claims. So um, bottom line is this, that um, don't create licenses because it, um, on your own because it just destroys the ecosystem. And um, if we're talking about free and open source licenses, at least in the AI systems, they must conform to these curated definitions. I also uh, made a reference to, um, you know, since I'm talking about and giving reference to, to several different licenses, for example, Meta's um, Llama 2 or Llama 3, um, I would agree that perhaps the intention is novel, the intention is good, um, that is to somehow you know, regulate ethics into the AI systems, but this can be done by other ways. And um, the application and integration of how they're doing it into their licenses is not a good practice. And so the only um, ask from us to the commission and to the society and to the entire force ecosystem is this, that um, it's always, it's very pernicious to engage in open washing it does not yield any good results for the entire free software community. And so um, until we have a definition, we must abide by the principles that have already been laid down. So yeah, 
that was the crux of what I wanted to deliver with this talk. And um, I hope uh, the message is loud and clear. Um, I'm open to any questions should you have now, or if you want to discuss those um, outside, I'm going to be at the venue. But um, there are also certain ways that you can uh, connect with me as here. And uh, since we're talking about, or since uh, you know, I talked about this uh, report that uh, I delivered together with Free Software Foundation, if anybody is interested in um, looking up the policy brief that we presented, you can just scan and uh, have a look at a policy brief. So thank you very much once again. Hello, okay. Thank you, Nikarika. Uh, do we have any questions here? Uh, hi, so great speech at first. Um, my question, you mentioned some regulations that are coming up in the EU. Uh, do you know maybe any names or how we can, uh, like, where we can um, watch for them when they happen and uh, where to learn about them? Thanks. Yeah, for sure. So um, I was basically alluding to the uh, AI Act. And under the AI Act, also, you have uh, certain exemptions for um, free and open source AI systems. And that's also one of the reasons why um, the companies or the providers of AI systems are more and more engaging in open washing. Since um, if, you, if you want to read the benefits of those provisions under the AI Act, um, essentially, you have to um, I mean, it's a big uh, bonus because if you if you if you're if you're counted as um, a false uh, AI system provider, then essentially you just escape these um, this obligation of providing this technical documentation, etc., or making it publicly available. Instead, you have uh, certain obligations that are probably, I'd say, not so tedious, and so everybody wants to, you know, um, take advantage somehow one way or the other and which is also another reason why this uh, this problem is becoming uh, it's just looming large because of uh, the obligations under the act yeah. thanks any more questions okay hi uh, this was a very uh, interesting talk and uh, the ideas uh, laid out here now, I have one or maybe two questions. One would be, um, in one of your slides, you've shown that uh, decent AI consists of several components, tokenizers, yep. machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. But the core of uh, every decent AI is its mind, right? The, the, what is built as the neural net mm -hmm. or the mo mo model. Now, you can open source or make available uh, the software for tokenizing, machine learning, etc. How do you make open source or freely available the mind? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the software is not changing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there are versions, builds, releases, but once the software is re released, it's uh, relatively uh, static, right? But the, the neural net, which is learning, once it's completed its learning, it, it will still continue slightly learning, so it changes. Yeah. How do you make that uh, available? Um, I think you've um, you know, really hit the nail on the coffin with this question because um, this is in fact a problem that um, even OSI is trying to tackle. Um, if you see, if you look at the open source uh, AI definition. Um, okay, wait, I will uh, first begin with uh, that you know, of course, there are problems with you know the AI uh, training data set learning by itself, or you know even having uh, several different errors in the data, tel uh, data set itself. Now, this is a big problem, and I think the entire AI community, also the FOSS community, who are part of uh, defining the definition for this um, AI openness and AI, they're aware of this problem. They know that um, you know, as AI company or an AI system is um, built with several different components, it's a mix of several different components, and every such component, in order to be called open, must be open. Um, 
we're looking at, everybody's looking at those challenges, the pros and cons, there are different, you know, also theories around it. Should it, everything be open or should it be um, open, say, on the basis of, yeah, we leave certain things as open, certain primary things as open, and others, which perhaps maybe because of the legal regulations, etc., cannot be left open as a bit closed. So there, there's, there's always this, you know, tug of war between what needs to be left open, what not, what can be left open, what not, and which is why um, this definition provided by OSI is under draft, and they've had like nine versions already. Um, and in this current version, there's also in the end, um, there's this statement about these freedoms apply both to a fully functional system and to discrete elements of a system. So with every definition, they're also trying to come up with ways as to how, say, different systems in different components in, in an AI system can also be somehow labeled as open and free. Though, of course, I would also agree to the fact that, say, if we're talking about model weights, which are also an essential component of AI system, cannot be per se, um, in its traditional sense, be labeled as open source because it's not a source code. It's an output of uh, running the training data, yeah? So essentially, it cannot be um, open source per se, but then uh, do we have any other license or an alternate for making that open right now, currently? No, and which is why I said that in the future, perhaps there will come a time where we have dedicated AI licenses where you know it covers not only, say, the software part of it, but also hardware, also, say, the tokenizers, the model weights, the training data, etc. So it will be probably a robust AI license, but for now, this is only capturing the source code that is involved in the AI systems. And of course, now there are lots of studies that are also looking exactly at the same question that you asked. So yeah. thank you for this question. Okay, so um, my second question would be ethical uh, constraints. You mentioned them, and uh, you also mentioned that uh, some of the big companies have uh, committees looking into it uh, yeah. where they are putting restrictions in place uh, of what their AIs are capable of uh, producing to the user. Uh, I mean, the most prominent things are uh, avoiding racial and uh, similar insults. Mm -hmm. Now, w w I understand why they're doing it. Uh, because the potential for misuse is really big. Mm -hmm. But uh, is, uh, do you think, or people where you are uh, moving about, do you feel that the responsibility for ethical constraining lies with the AI slash company owning and uh, operating it, or does it lie with the uh, 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 people who are using it? Mm -hmm. Because in my view, uh, yeah. ethics uh, imply intent. Mm -hmm. and AI has no intention there. Mm -hmm. It is the user who mm -hmm. wants, uh, I don't know, Google's uh, deep mind to um, create uh, racial slurs. It was not Google's mi uh, deep mind that, that uh, originally that did that. So mm -hmm. uh, what is your view on that? Right, um, okay. So about these, um, about these ethical checklists, um, my personal opinion is this, that sure, the responsibility lies with the uh, provider, indeed, and that is uh, the one who's providing or placing it in the market, um, these AI systems. But at the same time, levying these ethical restrictions on the basis of popularly well-documented standardized um, licenses is a wrong practice. So as I mentioned before, that you know all these big companies who are creating their own licenses, um, it's fine, it's great, um, if, as a, if as a tool for checking the ethical compliance checklist or for making things some more ethically compliant, they want to come up with certain licenses, they could. And these, as I said, you know, potentially their intention was great, but these could then be called as, say, responsible licenses or restrictive licenses, enabling an ethical compliance. And that is completely fine. But what I'm trying to say here is that Having those as restrictive licenses is fine, it's great, but do not call it as free and open source licenses because then it just clashes with um, 
the other existing free and open source licenses and it just causes a legal it just you know somehow the legal interoperability is lost so and there are potentially a lot of other downsides involved as well i'm just summarizing this um for the sake of you know brevity of time um and yeah which is why i would say the onus definitely lies on providers but this should also come from, say, regulations and guidelines um, that we're also seeing develop all across the world. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. An applause, please. <laughs> if you have any more questions, you're free to find Harika in the conference. Thank you. Mm -hmm.